Marcus Aurelius, in his book Meditations, writes, Don't ever forget these things. The nature of the world, my nature, how I relate to the world, what proportion of it I make up, that you are part of nature and no one can prevent you from speaking and acting in harmony with it, always. For me, there is tremendous truth in these words. It is essentially a roadmap towards finding meaning in life. To find meaning, one must first understand the nature of the world or the universe. Second, understand my nature, human nature. And third, understand how oneself or humans in general relate to the world and what proportion of it they make up. And lastly, understand that man is part of nature and must act in harmony with it. So, to begin, what is the nature of the world? Let's start with this image of our home, the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy has a diameter of approximately 100,000 light years and contains between 200 and 400 billion stars. Now, look at, here is an image of the moon in the night sky. Let's zoom in on a little red square. Each one of those specks of light is a galaxy. While it is impossible for, impossible for us to count all the galaxies in the universe, indeed it's quite possible that the universe extends infinitely, or, there are, or that there are multiple universes, uh, current calculations estimate there are 500 billion galaxies in the universe, each, like the Milky Way, containing hundreds of billions of unique solar systems. So, if anything is certain about the nature of the universe, it is that, for all, practi it, is that it is, for all practical purposes, infinite. Another key aspect of the nature of the world, or the universe, is that it is chaotic and random. Whether some underlying meaning or direction exists in the universe is irrelevant. In all practical situations, the sheer number of variables and forces at play ensure random and chaotic behavior. Lastly, the world is driven by constant change and flux, and the, fu the fundamental creative force of the universe. As Marcus Aurelius states, everything is born from change. There is nothing that nature loves more than to alter what exists and to make new things like it. All that exists is the seed of what will emerge from it. From the Big Bang to the flowers of spring, the creative force of the universe shines forth. Even in the wake of complete destruction, the creative force of the universe brings about rebirth. Take, for instance, the eruption of Mount St. Helens. The Mount, uh, of one of the greatest volcanic eruptions in recent history, the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens flattened vegetation and buildings over 230 square miles. And yet, just 10 years later, satellite images reveal significant plant regrowths around the base of the mountain and surrounding regions. 19 years after the eruption, all, all but the area immediately surrounding the crater has been, uh, it remains barren. Thus, we see that in addition to be, being infinite, chaotic, and random, the universe in which we live in is governed by the fundamental creative force, a life-giving force constantly bringing about change and rebirth. Now that we've explored the nature of the universe, it is time for us to turn to the second area in Aurelius, that Aurelius delineates. My nature, or human nature. To begin, humans are, like all animals, driven by instincts. As Freud writes, human actions are a re result of two subconscious drives, eros and thanatos, the sexual and aggressive instincts. Most people <laughs> now argue that Freud may have placed too much of an emphasis on these two instinctual drives. It is without doubt that these drives in large part govern human nature uh, and thought, human nature, thought, and action. Additionally, Freud, as well as many other psychoanalysts, contend that human behavior has a naturally defensive nature. Notable defense mechanisms include projection, repression, ras rationalization, and denial. However, despite these limitations, man has the capacity for reason, reflection, and freedom of action. Lastly, largely as a product of these limitations and potentialities, man, uh, humans are motivated by various drives toward the greater. The will to power, the will to meaning, and the will to love. Thus, we establish that man's nature is comprised of his limitations as a naturally defensive and instinctual creature, his unique potentialities, the capacity for reason, reflection, and freedom of action, and his drives toward power and meaning and love. Having now addressed the nature of the universe and human nature, it is now possible to address Aurelius' third point, human existence relative to the universe. Take a close look at this image. Regarding it, Carl Sagan said, from this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of particular interest, but for us, it's different. 
Consider this dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it is everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate demand of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forger, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and every peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, each teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader. Every saint and every sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mode of dust suspended in the sunbeam. Aurelius writes, Human lives are brief and trivial. Yesterday, a blob of semen. Tomorrow, embalming fluid, ash. If anything is clear, it is that in the grand scheme of the universe, human existence, let alone the existence of one individual, is utterly insignificant. Man is a minuscule, finite existence in a boundless, endless world. If we humans were to kill ourselves off in nuclear war or through environmental destruction, nothing else in the universe would change. And yet, the infinite and random forces of the universe have a tremendous effect on us. As reflected in O Fortuna, a medieval poem from Carmina Burana, man is at the mercy of fate. O Fortune, just as the moon, stands const constantly changing, always increasing and decreasing. Detestable life, now difficult and then easy. Deceptive sharp mind, poverty, power, it melts them like ice. In an instant, the universe can complete, completely overturn one's life. Thus, in the grand scheme of things, man is both insignificant and at the mercy of, random, of the random and chaotic forces of the universe. And yet, this is true for all existence. All animals, all plants, all protozoa, all planets, are all temporary specks on an endless canvas of time and space. So what makes man unique? In Progress and Power, American historian Carl Lotus Becker states, Significance of man is that he is the part of the universe that asks the question, What is the significance of man? He alone can stand apart imaginatively and, regarding himself in the universe, in eternal aspects, pronounces a judgment. The significance of man is that he is insignificant and is aware of it. Becker's quote in many, in many ways reflects the ancient beliefs of Socrates. The whole idea of Socratic ignorance, is, as established in the Apology, is that the greatest wisdom man can achieve is to recognize that his wisdom is worthless. In other words, to know that he knows nothing. Thus, in the first unique, thus, the first unique trait of humans relative to the universe is that we are capable of, rec capable of recognizing the ins insignificance of our existence and the ignorance of our wisdom. However, it is important to recognize that the, there are other things which differentiate humans from other existence in the universe. Well, it is in my mind quite likely that intelligent life exists elsewhere, uh, elsewhere in the universe. Of the millions of species on our planet, the human species is unique in that it possesses distinctive evolutionary developments that have allowed for the development of higher order civilization. Namely, the opposable thumb, which is allowed for the use of tools, the development of vocal cords, allowed for uh, development of language, and an enlarged brain, which is allowed for the development of civilization and eventually reason. And yet, despite these evolutionary changes, man remains an animal. Man, even amidst the great civilization that has emerged as a consequence of his supposed superiority, is driven by the same instincts that drive beasts. One last thing must thus be added to the list of things unique about human existence relative to the rest of existence. Man has the ability to destroy himself as a species. Thus, we see the extremes of human existence. O Fortuna, Fate has provided man with the tools to lift himself out of the evolutionary sludge, the capacity for reason, Socratic wisdom, and civilization. And yet, without breaking free of the, his instinctual and defensive nature, man stands over an abyss. Nietzsche writes, Man is something that shall be overcome. What have we done to overcome him? All beings so far have created something beyond themselves. Do you want to be the ebb of this great flood and even go back to the beasts rather than overcome man? You have made your way from worm to man, and much of you is still worm. Once you were apes, and even now, man is much more ape than any other man. Man is a rope tied between the beast and the overman. Uh, a rope over an abyss. What is great in man is that he is a bridge and not an end. This is the fundamental issue of human existence. We as humans stand on a, on a rope across an abyss, the abyss of nuclear war, environmental destruction, and the exploitation of our fellow man. No matter how good our balance, if we remain on the rope, it is inevitable that we will fall. But as Nietzsche states, the rope, the rope that signifies mankind, is great. It provides us with the opportunity to overcome our animal existence and create something beyond ourselves. 
It is thus that we come to the fundamental drive of human existence, the will to transcendence. Fran writes, the need for transcendence is one of the most basic uh, needs of man, rooted in the fact that his, in his self, of his self-awareness, in the fact that he is not satisfied with the role of the creature, that he cannot accept himself as dice thrown out of a cup. He needs to feel as the creator, as one transcending the passive role of being created. And thus, we come to address Aurelius' final point and the meaning of life. The meaning of life is the will to transcendence, a transcendence achievable only through acting in harmony, ac action in harmony with the universe uh, and the creative force of the universe. As Aurelius states, no one can prevent you from living in harmony with nature. Man is his own bridge to transcendence. He possesses within himself the tools to overcome his passive creature state and take on the active role of creator. However, transcendence cannot be achieved within the sphere of the self alone. Transcendence is only possible through union with the world and with the fundamental creative force that governs it. Frankel, in Man's Search for Meaning, states, by declaring, that by declaring that man is responsible and must actualize the potential meaning of his life, I wish to stress that the true meaning of life is to be discovered in the world rather than within man or his own psyche, as though it were a closed system. I have termed this constituent characteristic the self-transcendence self of human existence. Fromm also supports this notion. In The Art of Loving, he writes, In any kind of creative work, the creating person unites himself with his material, which represents the world outside himself. Thus, we must emphasize that the drive for transcendence requires union with the outside world. Lastly, it is necessary to explore, explain why the creativity that results from transcendence, uh, transcendence from the creature to creator states, must be in harmony with the creative force of the universe. Let us take, for example, the oil rig Deepwater Horizon. Completed in 2000, Deepwater Horizon was one of the most technologically advanced oil rigs of its time. An ultra deep water, dynamically positioned, semi submersible, column stabilizing offshore drilling rig, Deepwater Horizon drilled the deepest oil well ever in 2009 with a vertical depth of 35,000 feet. It would be a fair summary to say that Deepwater Horizon was an engineering marvel, a marvelous culmination of technology and creativity. On April 20th, 2010, an oil, an oil, uh, following an oil well blowout, Deepwater Horizon exploded and sunk. As a result, up to 70,000 barrels of crude oil are now being leaked in the Gulf of Mexico every day, eclipsing the infamous Exxon Valdez oil spill as the worst oil disaster in U.S. history. There is no doubt that the deep water oil spill will have a dev devastating effect on the environment and the ecosystems of the Gulf and the Gulf Coast. While blame for this horrific disaster can certainly be placed upon in inadequate precautionary measures and shutoff mechanisms, the root of this issue lies with human creativity in opposition rather than in harmony with the creative force of the universe. Well, the creative force of the universe is a life-giving force. The creativity involved in the construction and implementation of, deep water horizon, of the Deepwater Horizon oil platform was in service of a destructive force, boring holes deep into the ocean's floor to greedily harvest the planet's non-renewable resources. Just as with the creation of missiles or small experiment factories, the brilliant creativity behind designing Deepwater Horizon was thus motivated by the selfish drives for aggression and exploitation, leaving man still suspended over the abyss, ever closer to his doom. Therefore, it is essential to emphasize that not all creativity is in harmony with the creative force of the universe, but that, creativity, but that the creativity that results from transcendence must invariably be in such harmony. Having at, la having at last addressed the four parts of Aurelius' list of critical things to explore and established the meaning of life based on these considerations, it is now possible to explore the practical implications of this meaning. Thus, we come to the fifth and final chapter of this philosophical journey, and what of it? Franco writes, one should not search for an abstract meaning of life. Everyone has his own specific vocation or mission in life to carry out a concrete assignment which demands fulfillment. Therein he cannot be replaced nor can his life be repeated. Thus, everyone's task is as unique as, his, as is his specific opportunity to implement it. As Frankel states, one's specific vocation is, in life is determined by one's unique circumstances, opportunities, and abilities. Therefore, while the will to transcendence uh, may be the fundamental abstract meaning of life, it is up to each individual how they choose to actively engage in the creative force of the universe and thus shape the course of, the day, uh, course of their day-to-day -day thoughts and actions. Thus, uh, there, there are countless ways in which one can partake in the creative force of the universe. The classic example, of course, is that of the artist, or that of the musician, or the movie director. 
But there are countless vocations outside these traditional creative realms. To use myself as an example, I've determined, given my own passions and abilities and current state of the world, that my specific vocation through which I, through which I will pursue transcendence is in the engineering and architectur architectural fields of green design. The creativity involved in, the con in this concentration connects deeply to the creative force of the universe in two distinct ways. First, just, a, just as the creative force of the universe serves an, as an agent of cleansing and rebirth in the wake of devastating natural disasters, through my pursuits in, the, pursuits in the field of green engineering, I will seek to mend the destruction that has resulted from years of human creativity against, against the creative force of the universe. By transcending my individual existence to take part in the collective creative force of the universe, I will seek to heal the earth through environmental solutions to pollution and environmental destruction. Yet, in addition to, in addition to seeking to mend the harm that, I, that has already been done, I intend to, through my work, bring human civilization as a whole to be more in harmony with nature. Through the use of design and implementation of technology, I will further intertwine human society with nature both in a physical, urban planning sense, in the collection and use of power, and in the development of more efficient transportation systems. <laughs>